Good morning, church. This morning's scripture reading is from 1 Corinthians 15, starting verse 50 through 58. You'll find this on page 904 in the Black Bibles under the seat in front of you. It will also be on the screens for you to follow along. If you are physically able, please stand in honor of the reading of God's word. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 50. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of, the sin, of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Together. <clears throat> Lord, this is a noisy world, and so we would ask uh, for supernatural peace, a quieting of our hearts and minds, that we can not just hear your word, but benefit from it and enjoy it and cherish it. We love you so very much, and you love us way more than that. Pray that you would bless the hearing of this word, and we pray for change and growth. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There's something particularly majestic about a well-played trumpet, isn't there? Emphasis on well-played. Growing up, I listened to an aspiring trumpeter practice the trumpet, particularly Old MacDonald had a farm, and it sounded like a parakeet choking on a kazoo. I, was I remember thinking, like, I'm pretty convinced that MacDonald doesn't want to farm anymore, especially especially in his old age, you know, this close to retirement. He doesn't have time for any of this. <clears throat> but there's something majestic about a well-played trumpet, thus the regal tradition of playing trumpets or other horns to announce the arrival of a king, especially the arrival of a victorious king returning from battle. Horns in service of returning military leaders was very common in Paul's day, so it is fitting that horns make an appearance in this text in light of a victory, namely King Jesus' victorious return in the resurrection of the dead. And indeed, this morning, we are very much pressing into this victory, a wonderful way to nearly wrap up our time in 1 Corinthians, because it's a fantastic book, but also not the easiest or most comfortable book to navigate in our day, is it? So we need all the victories that we can get here at the end. And boy, do we get a doozy, a victory that undergirds everything else we've been discussing in this letter. Two exhortations this morning in light of this victory. Number one, let's celebrate, church, the death of death. And then number two, in light of that, let's stay the course. Let's celebrate the death of death, and let's stay the course. And we'll start with that first exhortation. doesn't get much better than this. Let's celebrate the death of death. The past few Sundays, we've been discussing the reality and the centrality of Christ's resurrection from the dead, as well as the resurrection from the dead of all those who are in Christ, those who confess that Christ died for our sins and put their hope in his grace. Apparently, the believers in Corinth were standing firm 
and their convictions concerning Jesus' resurrection, but there were some doubts about the bodily resurrection of people, probably because it conflicted with their Greek worldview concerning physical and spiritual things. But we saw that Christ's bodily resurrection and our bodily resurrection are a package deal. And since Christ has been raised, we will also be raised. And the resurrection bodies we're in store for, they will be like Christ's resurrection bodies. Therefore, on this level of amazing perfection that's honestly very hard to put into words, we did what we could to describe these bodies last week, and we get another pass at it this morning as well. Look at verses 50 through 52. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. So there's a sense in which these doubters were on to something with their dualistic concerns about the physical and the spiritual. How can we be resurrected into the afterlife given that we have physical bodies, and yet the afterlife will be of a fundamentally different spiritual quality? How does this all work? Well, for one thing, there are some major errors baked into that understanding of the afterlife. The afterlife, what we as Christians talk about as the new heaven and the new earth, will remain physical in a very significant sense. There's even good reason to believe that we will still have jobs, and we will work the land, and we will eat and drink. We won't be floating around in the clouds, listening to you know the, the Celtic angels, whatever comes into your mind. That's not the biblical conception of heaven. Praise God, at least in my opinion. But also, the flesh and blood of our present perishing earthly bodies is indeed not suitable for inheriting the fully consummated kingdom of God, our final place in the new heaven and the new earth. So the bodies in which we will be raised will be of a renewed, imperishable quality. In this must happen, verse 53, because perishable bodies don't belong in imperishable places. That'd be like wearing a, a bow tie and a seersucker suit to a wedding in the Pacific Northwest. You would be completely out of place. The marvel of these bodies is beyond our understanding, but Jesus does give us some very intriguing hints. After his resurrection, Jesus still ate meals. Famously so with his disciples on the beach in John chapter 21. Yet before the beach meal, we encounter two instances in which the resurrected Jesus just appears before his disciples, even though the room they were in was locked. We don't know exactly how this happened, but it's fascinating to consider how Jesus might have done this and what his resurrection body potentially had to do with it. And recall that Mary Magdalene, when she first encountered the risen Jesus after visiting what turned out to be his empty tomb, she thought he was the gardener. It wasn't until he said her name that Mary recognized him, which tells us that it was still very much Jesus, but just a bit different because he was Jesus in his new resurrection body. I've heard it suggested from someone else that in this new heaven and earth, this may be how we run into people that we knew in this life. It will be like passing someone on the street you haven't seen in 30 years, and you're thinking to yourself, wait a minute, was that, was that Mike? And then you say, you just you turn around and say, like, Mike, Mike, is that you? And then you both fully recognize each other and embrace. The issue is that you both look a lot better than you used to look. And check it out, it's not just the dead Christians who will get these resurrection bodies. Those alive at Christ's return, that is his second coming, they'll get these bodies too. Verse 51, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. So we won't all be dead when Christ returns, but we will all be changed. We'll all get the resurrection bodies. 
And so in this grand, spectacular, mysterious moment, those still alive when Christ returns will be totally transformed. The kind of transformation that exceeds anything you've seen in the movies. This is way different. This is way better than, I don't know, I thought Spider-Man. And, and you don't even have to endure an exotic spider bite to participate. You just, you just get to do it because of Jesus. And as we're transformed, God will be right there with us. His presence announced with the blast of a trumpet, verse 52. Last trumpet signaling very publicly. That's what trumpets are all about, right? If you want to be public, use a trumpet. They're very loud and piercing. Very publicly signaling that the end has come. And thus the end of death. The death of death, we might say. Look at verses 54 and 55, when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the moral puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Listen, death has been, in the worst way, rather successful, hasn't it? And you know this. Death has scored so many wins, so many points, and it continues to do so today. We're connected to it personally through friends and family. We hear about it. We read about it in the news. The news essentially becoming this bizarre combination of stories about death and then also some stories about the 10 best beaches in America. That's basically the news these days. And yet the death of death has already been secured on account of Christ's death and resurrection, so death is on the clock. And when Jesus returns, he will deal the final victorious blow, defeating death once and for all. The saying that Paul refers to, which it reads kind of like a, a poetic song, it's a mashup of expressions taken from two Old Testament prophetic books, namely Isaiah chapter 25 and Hosea chapter 13. Isaiah 25 looks ahead to the salvation of all peoples, death being swallowed up in destruction, the Lord God wiping away tears from all faces. That's in Isaiah chapter 25, not just in Revelation, that's in Isaiah. Death not just taken away or removed, but comprehensively vanquished in light of Christ's bodily resurrection and the bodily resurrection of his people. Hosea 13 is actually a prophecy of judgment against the northern kingdom of Israel, but Paul reappropriates the language in that text about judgment and death in a way that turns it basically into a taunt. Death and judgment should have been not just Israel's, but ours on account of our sin, but Christ's resurrection has taken away the pangs and the sting of death. So what are you going to do about it now, death? basically, is what we're having. You've got nothing. Come at me, death. Nothing like the resurrection of God himself to put away death forever. Why does Christ's resurrection give us victory over death and remove its sting? Well, the sting of death is sin, verse 56, since death is ultimately the punishment for our sin. And the power of sin is the law, talking most specifically here about the law that came through Moses to the Israelites. And its power lies in the fact that the law ends up revealing our sinfulness as we fall short of its standards and is connected in some way to our desire to sin in light of our rebelliousness. If you're among the category of people who had a childhood, don't need to raise your hand, but if that describes you, You know what your impulses are when rules are established. Breaking them becomes intriguing. And then the law itself can't save us. But Christ himself bore the penalty for our sin on the cross. And in rising from the dead, he drained death of its power. And how do the people of God respond to all of this? 
I, I hope I don't have to tell you because you're already feeling this a little bit organically. You kind of want to say amen to some of these things, but you're not sure if this is the right context. Maybe you're new. Like, do people say amen here? I wish they did more, to be honest with you. So you can say amen to these kinds of things. How do the people of God respond to all of this? For the sake of being thorough, even though you already know this, here's how we respond. We celebrate is what we do. Look at verse 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christian joy is tethered directly to celebration, specifically celebration of the deliverance and victory that God has accomplished for us. Thus, the instructions to the Israelites to celebrate various festivals, including very famously, as many of you know, the Passover Thus, the celebration here in verse 57, in light of the resurrection, a celebration which is notably God-centric. The headline here isn't, this is really important, the headline here is not that, that you have victory over death, or I have victory over death, or that we have victory over death. God has vanquished death. And we participate in that victory, so thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. As you can see, we celebrate, in large part, by giving thanks to God for big things like the victory we have in Christ, for the small things like our daily provisions, for all of the things. Which means that if you're in a joy slump, there's actually a very strong chance that you're also in a gratitude slump. A lot of people think, well... Uh, I'm not giving thanks because I'm not experiencing a lot of joy. When I experience joy, then I'll start giving thanks again. Try giving thanks, and then maybe you'll start experiencing joy again. Don't wait until the joy comes back to start praising God. I would get after it now for the sake of retrieving the joy of your salvation. I mean, this, this might sound cliche, but I'm completely serious. I know, we've talked about this, I know that all of you are, are you're above average, every last one of you. But for average people... Statistically, the first thing most adults do when they roll out of bed in the morning is check their email or their Instagram, which, of course, as we've been learning the last few years, is very smart, is very healthy. What if, instead of something like that, the first thing we did after waking up each morning was to step outside for five minutes and either take a seat or walk around and offer up some prayers of thanksgiving to the Lord. And we just made this a habit, and we did it every day, five minutes. Or what if, you know, in seasons of, of suffering or discouragement or whatever, you gathered some friends together for an evening of celebration and giving thanks to God in song and in prayer. Did you know we don't have to be gathered here on Sunday mornings for you to do that? You can create your own gatherings whenever you want. I'm reminded of Paul and Silas praying and singing hymns to God after they were thrown into the Philippian jail. I'm reminded of Ukrainian Christians a couple of years ago singing hymns of praise to God while huddled together underground in subway stations. That's how you persevere in Christian joyfulness in the midst of suffering and uncertainty. Death may claim you now, but you know the death of death has been secured, and it will not have the final word. And so you celebrate and you give thanks. Are we a celebrating people, rejoicing in the victory that we have through our Lord Jesus Christ? Are celebratory rhythms included in the patterns of our lives? Sunday morning gatherings, by the way, as I said earlier this morning, they're intended to be one of those rhythms. So come, be consistent, Give thanks for the sake of your joy. And by the way, since we're a community, for the sake of other people's joy, not just your joy. You may have enough joy on a given Sunday morning, but other people don't, and so they need you to come and encourage them in Christ Jesus. Speaking of perseverance, as we celebrate the victory we have in Christ, here's our second exhortation. So let's stay the course. First exhortation, let's celebrate the death of death. And now, guess what? Let's stay the course, church. Look at verses 50, sorry, just 58 for now. Therefore, my beloved brothers, 
be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Brothers and sisters in Christ, in light of the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, the first fruits of the bodily resurrection we will ultimately experience, resurrection that guarantees us victory over death, in light of all of that, be steadfast. In other words, hold fast to the faith, not being moved by any sort of external challenges or difficulties or threats. And as you hold fast to the faith, make sure that you are always abounding in the work of the Lord, which is basically a fancy way of saying loving God and loving your neighbor. This, this work of the Lord, it's more than just the business of pastors or, or global missionaries like Matt and Emily Barr. It's their work, but it's also our work. It's the work of all believers, very often carried out in the ordinary rhythms of our everyday lives. It's the kind of work we allude to in Article 8 of our Statement of Faith entitled Christian Living. Here's what we say. We say, God commands us to love Him supremely and others sacrificially and to live out our faith with care for one another, compassion toward the poor, and justice for the oppressed. With God's Word, the Spirit's power, in fervent prayer in Christ's name, we are to combat the spiritual forces of evil. In obedience to Christ's commission, we are to make disciples among all people, always bearing witness to the gospel and word and deed. That is the work of the Lord. And in light of the resurrection, we can be certain that abounding in the work of the Lord is never in vain. It sure seems like it's in vain sometimes, doesn't it? Like you're being faithful and nothing is happening. Or you're being faithful and if anything it seems like you're ending up worse off, at least by the standards of the world, than those who aren't being faithful. Or you're being faithful but, but spiritual forces of evil really seem to be winning. I'm reminded of a missionary partner who shared here recently at City Church about the ministry she's been doing abroad for seven years in a very difficult area, how she and her team have been abounding in the work of the Lord but have yet to see anyone become a Christian. But our labor is not in vain. And actually the word vain gives us this huge hint concerning the logic of this comfort. We came across the word vain earlier in chapter 15 in the context of Christ's resurrection. If Christ has not been raised, then our faith is, remember, in vain, verse 14. But Christ has been raised, verse 20, praise God, which we already saw guarantees our own bodily resurrection. And now we see that Christ's resurrection also guarantees the efficacy of our labor of faithful Christian living. Since Christ has been raised, our faith is not in vain, which means that our labor in the Lord is also not in vain. <laughs> which makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? If the guy you're working for rose again from the dead, you can feel pretty good about the work you're doing on his behalf, I would say. Keeping in mind that there's a whole lot going on behind the scenes that he can see that we're not privy to. Which means that conversely, it's kind of the difficult, uncomfortable news. All other kinds of labor are rather suspect, aren't they? They're in grave danger of ultimately being in vain. Listen, I am, I'm a very strong believer in what we call God's common grace, that God's activity is not limited solely to the lives of his people. So for example, I do not think it's right to say that everything about your life is a waste if you're not a Christian. But I gotta say, a whole lot of what the average person is up to and has planned for the future and is banking their hope upon is awfully vulnerable to things like a drunk driver or a pandemic or the whims of an international leader who wakes up with stomach indigestion and decides to hit the nuclear button. And eventually we'll all die of something regardless and then if you're not in Christ, 
What do you have? Maybe some kind of legacy. Well, I hate to break it to you, but that will fade from view over time. And it could always be canceled by the cancel mobs anyway. Maybe you've improved the lives of some people who will live beyond you, which is great, but they'll die one day too. And without God, it's actually really hard to define what we're even shooting for when it comes to defining improved lives. But our labor in the Lord, that is not in vain. Because it's grounded in something that transcends our earthly circumstances and therefore has transcendent cosmic implications. Yes, the resurrection of Jesus, it happened at a real time, in a real place. He has a real resurrection body. But it's a reality that also transcends our earthly circumstances and is therefore unchangeable, immovable, not subject to the whims of a dictator, because God himself is transcendent, unchangeable, and unmovable. He's not contained by this world. He is totally beyond it. <laughs> Case in point, Christ ascended into the presence of the Father, a plane of existence that you cannot touch with a nuke. And he will return an unstoppable reality grounded in God's supernatural power and providence. This, to be honest, this is one of the reasons why I want to be a Christian. Yes, I am a Christian because I absolutely believe it to be true upon investigation. I believe that it's far more plausible and reasonable than any other worldview. But I also want to be a Christian, let me tell you, not just because of cold hard facts, but because of what it offers. In Christ you get, among many other things, an opportunity to abound in something with real meaning and real value even when you can't see all of the meaning and value. And the meaning and the value are subject to nothing other than our transcendent God, the one who raised Christ from the dead. One of the reasons there's so much anxiety right now in our age is that when you extract God from it, everything seems awfully vulnerable and quite possibly vain. I just heard a guy from a few years ago talking about how, you know, we're getting to this place where we're going to have humans that aren't really needed anymore, and he's just thinking, what will we do when technology replaces humans? We'll have all this time. And he was giving, he was talking about this in a TED Talk. He's like, let's just give them drugs and computer games. And he was completely serious. But in Christ, you're on remarkably solid, meaningful ground. Your labor is not in vain. It's never in vain. So please be so encouraged this morning. If you're discouraged, may the Lord lift your head and comfort you. Keep going. It's totally worth it. God's doing so many things in you and through you, many of which you do not perceive and will never know about, at least on this side of heaven. I want to end by drawing your attention to the testimony of Tanya Glessner, who wrote a memoir called The Light You Bring, and recently she wrote a shorter piece for Christianity Today. Tanya grew up in a violent and abusive home, eventually finding out at age 11 that the dad who raised her along with her mom wasn't even her real dad. Upon contacting her biological dad, she realized that he really didn't want anything to do with her, and he made minimal effort to see her before he died of cancer in 2008. After her mom and the man she thought was her dad got divorced, Tanya lived with her mom and two younger brothers. Her mom continued to choose men who were prone to addiction and violence. When they turned those violent tendencies on me, I decided it was better to become a monster than to let myself be devoured by one. And then Tanya says, I started beating girls up at school and being rewarded at home for my victories. I was eventually expelled, leaving me to complete my schooling that year in the mental health ward of a hospital. Once I returned home, I ran away repeatedly and would stay with friends until their parents turned me away. My mom, having had enough, sent me to live with a relative <coughs> where I started my freshman year of high school. But I was kicked out soon enough after a confrontation with my teacher, and I finished the school year elsewhere. During my sophomore year, I moved back home, and my mother and I got along like rabid dogs. Eventually, Tanya married a man who himself abusive, was himself abusive, 
and then got a divorce after having two children with him. On weekends, when the kids were with their dad, she would spend some time with her friends, who eventually introduced her to meth, which became a full-blown addiction, and she began selling meth in order to fund her addiction. And this is in Tanya's words again. She says, three years into my addiction, I found myself at a complete stranger's house, suicidally depressed, injecting myself with meth. I collapsed to my knees on the verge of losing consciousness and cried out to God to save me. I wasn't prepared for how he would choose to respond. As a child, I had attended various Catholic and Christian schools alongside public schools, and my grandmother was a strong Christian believer. Perhaps having spent so much time with her, I knew in that desperate moment that salvation could only come from God. A few weeks later, I stopped at a house to drop off some drugs. When I arrived, I saw a woman I had a bad history with, so I confronted her and put her in the hospital. I was arrested a week later and found myself facing 21 years in prison, so when I was offered a plea agreement of eight years, I gratefully accepted it. After spending three months in county jail, I started attending a ministry group organized by a local church for inmates. Toward the end of one service, I approached one of the church members. We prayed together, and I accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Bit of a curveball, but work with me. City Church. How about that faithful Christian grandmother, amen? A grandmother that Tanya spent quite a bit of time with on account of the chaos going on with her own parents. There this grandmother was, loving her granddaughter sacrificially in the midst of an incredibly difficult season, watching her own daughter suffer at the hands of an abusive husband. She was most certainly abounding in the work of the Lord, her faith very evident to her granddaughter. But then this granddaughter started beating up classmates and getting expelled, and eventually she married a man who became abusive, and then she became a drug addict. And you know, I... I bet you top dollar there were moments in which Tanya's grandmother was thinking, have I been wasting my time? Has this all been in vain? And then a couple of decades later, Tanya became a Christian, in significant part because of her grandmother's influence. And it's hard to tell in this story, but it would appear everything in the story suggests that This conversion happened after her grandmother passed away. Her labor in the Lord was not in vain, but apparently she wasn't around to see the fruit of Tanya's conversion. And even if Tanya hadn't become a Christian, her grandmother's faithfulness still would not have been in vain because it's grounded in the resurrection not in the circumstances of this life. It's really important. So church, let's celebrate and give thanks. And in so doing, joyfully abide in Christ as we abound in the work of the Lord, no matter how difficult or painstaking or countercultural it might be in a given season. Our work is not in vain. And if you're here this morning and you are not following Christ, the resurrected Christ, I would love to invite you to repent of your sin, to confess Christ as your Savior, and to throw all of your hope upon His grace. Amen.